including probably a few thousand in this room, who will testify that the same Jesus Christ has changed their life. Um, Kyle? Kyle? Your response to any of those inquiries? Yeah. Hello. Testing. Are you with me? Okay. Uh, I think I would take a stab at the uh, Bubbles universe, the multiple universe, the contingency of that, and the real problem with that, that what you find is, is that when I put up my argument that the universe came into being, even if it was 17 billion years ago, that leaves too little time to evolve Earth, life on the Earth. And so um, a lot of scientists then are appealing to other, um, what they call science, but quite candidly, you'll have to admit they're, they're no more credible than a blind leap of faith in, in God. If, if you do throw out a model that says we need multiple universes in order to create life because any one lot, universe needs to be so finely tuned as to pop into being so that life can be here in a very short period of time on whatever scale you use, it won't happen unless you appeal to multiple universes. But then you have what's called the gambler's fallacy. And that is that if a gambler were sitting in a room and watching... Um, a, a man tossed a coin and he tossed it 10,000 times and it always came up heads. You have to ask the gambler, is he going to take a bid on the next toss that it's going to come up tails? And the gambler may say, well, yes, I will. And then you'll say, what are you basing that upon? If he says, well, it's because I believe that there were another 210,000 coins tossed outside of this auditorium. They had something different than these and these all came up heads I'm betting that puppy's going to come up tails. He's betting on a lot of different odds, and that's the problem with ap appealing to bubble universes, additional universes coming into being. Michael, your choice of uh, comments. Are we on here yet? Okay, I think this, is this the young man here that asked the question? No, he's sat oh. down. Oh, it, it's a great question. It's gosh, I, you know, if my 11-year-old asked that, I'd, uh, you know, this would be wonderful. You know, your brain is engaged. Uh, because that is one of the hard problems. But, it, but, but the problem exists whether you have one universe expanding or multiple universes or, or even if there's a God. You just simply ask, well, what's beyond that? And we have the capacity to ask that, but we can't really answer it because in a way the universe, when, when it's expanding, when the universe began and it's expanding, it's not expanding into anything. It is the space and time at, as it expands. It is everything. There, you can't even ask the question. It's like asking what's north of the North Pole. It's, it's a nonsensical question. It's unfortunate, but it's true, whether, it's true if you're a theist, too. What's beyond God? Who made God? These are infinite kind of questions that we can't really ask. And on the other, the Christ body thing, and people you know, gave their lives. I'm always amazed by this argument that uh, the Christians use. I mean, um, look at Marshall Applewhite. He convinced 39 hardcore disciples to take their lives to go to the UFO behind Jupiter. Uh, by committing suicide. The Jim Jones got 900 people to kill themselves and so on. Followers do this. They're true believers. That's Michael, what true believers do. Carbon dating? Cur oh, the carbon, for, the carbon dating was the... Uh, um, there are error bars in the carbon dating. It varies maybe about 10 to 12 percent on any given date, but it's fairly accurate. They've gotten much better at it now. You can use smaller samples. It's pretty accurate. Dr. Hogan? On carbon dating? Carbon dating. I think it's ridiculous. I think it was invented in 1950 with Willard Libby, University of Chicago, got a Nobel Prize for it, moved on to Stanford University. Uh, way before that, in 1830, the geologic column was developed. Really, the way they tell the age of things is by which position they are in the geologic column. They date the fossils by which layer they come from. Then they turn around and date the layers by which type of fossils are found in them. Circular reasoning. We'll cover that tomorrow in the seminar if you want to come. Um, all right. Good enough. Three questions. Question mostly for uh, Mr. Shermer, but for all three. What is your greatest motivation for being here and what do you fear if you didn't wouldn't have shown up today okay Me? yeah i think i'm particularly for dr holovan but uh the question i have is if the flood the cataclysm in 40 days and 40 nights if during that time he's going to put the trilobites up on in sedona and he's going to carve the grand canyon did he do this to confuse us good question given the various errors that I have experienced in textbooks and uh, contrary to some comments tonight and the um, omissions of contradictory information to the neo-Darwinistic theory, why should not one believe that these textbooks are written more from a philosophical position rather than from a search for truth? Michael, we'll start with you and move left. Okay. Uh, well, we, we kind of did the why we're here question uh, because I'm curious, like to know. Um, 
Thought I'd see uh, the city where the that has the team that the Lakers just beat last night. Uh, <laughs> just a gratuitous, just a little, yeah. <laughs> hey, but you had us scared for a while there. Uh, no, just because it's, you know, it's fun stuff. Uh, yeah, the Grand Canyon and all this, you know, did God plant the fossils to confuse us? No, it was Satan testing your faith, whatever. You know, yeah, of course, obviously, this is a bit of a problem for believers. Uh, what do you make of all this evidence? Errors and omissions in textbooks, I kind of addressed that uh, in, in my first part of my 10-minute thing. Um, uh, this is a problem, again, not, not, not for science. It's a problem for textbook publishing. Uh, scientists weed these things out. You don't see these errors. They get weeded out very quickly. It's the scientists themselves. If you go to an evolution conference, you're not going to find, like, universal agreement about stuff. You should see these guys going at it. They have all kinds of uh, great battles within evolutionary science. It's really a delight to see. It's nothing like what you think it is. Uh, as outsiders, you know, you've never been to an evolution conference, oh, they must have this sort of uniform religion-like agreement and everything. They don't. They fight over all kinds of things. All right. Kyle? I guess there was applause, but not very much. So you're going to have to do better next time. Go ahead. Um, okay. <laughs> Sorry. What were the uh, questions again, please? Okay. Okay. Um, Any one of them. Yeah. <laughs> um, why? Oh, why anybody's here? That was specifically for you. Yeah, Errors and omissions. I think um, I'm going to have to take the a view that co goes kind of with uh, Michael's, and that is that um, you see uh, that knowledge is a construction, that it's a product, that it's a moving target, it's constantly growing. Um, this year, science is going to be something completely different in 200 years. We're going to look back, and you know, I wish I'd put it up there: Jimi Hendrix in bell jeans, uh, or blue jeans, or bell-bottom pants and beads and stuff at a afro. You know, knowledge grows just like we change in time. Um, that's why I aim for some universals. I don't just say that nature reveals all of truth; um, that nature, as corrected or understood through the Bible, it reveals the truth. Uh, we, so we don't have a, a complete handle on this. Our textbooks are always going to have errors in them, and we're just going to have to live with that. Dr. Hubbard? Uh, I will choose the question, did God deceive us with the Grand Canyon, and that uh, Michael Schimmer's statement that this is a problem for believers. If you built a dam across Grand Canyon, get that projector off there if you would, a uh, huge lake would form. These red lines indicate what's called the snow line. Grand Canyon, 200 miles, cut across from, uh, from the upper right to the lower left. Grand Canyon, uh, the river enters the canyon at 2,800 feet above sea level. The top of the ridge is seven or 8,000 feet above sea level. So, some things to consider about Grand Canyon. Number one, the top is higher than the bottom. <laughs> Number two, the river only runs through the bottom. Number three, the top is higher than where the river enters the canyon by 4,000 feet. Number four, rivers don't flow uphill. There is no possible way that river made that canyon. Grand Canyon is quite obviously a washed out spillway from a couple of big lakes called Grand Lake and Hopi Lake. The lakes are gone. The beach is still there. No God didn't deceive us. I think he left behind incredible evidence that there was a flood, which indicates he judged this world and he's going to judge it again, whether you like it or not. Thank you, Doctor. Quick questions, quick answers. If we evolved, then why did we develop sexual reproduction when asexual reproduction is easily achieved? <sighs> Dr. Sherman, I uh, appreciate you uh, explaining that just because we don't find a natural explanation to things, that doesn't mean that uh, there's a divine explanation. But aren't you asking us to accept a theory where we see that goes against what we normally see in nature, that natural systems don't build things up gradually, but break things down. And in addition, we don't have one example, if it did happen, we don't have one example of an organism or an organ or even an organelle of how it formed in a step-by-step -step fashion. Very good. Third one. Dr. Shermer, if you want us to look at the Bible in a different way and see the meaning behind the story, tell me what do you think?